If I was in a time machine and I had the uh, option to change places with the head gardener of 1880, I think I, I would change because there were so many new things happening then and I think it would have been a time of great excitement. Victorian England was at its height and um, people were investing a lot of money in their gardens, trying out new techniques, keeping the house running with produce from the productive gardens and things were going ahead full steam. England was on a high and going well. High to the empire. These four acres of kitchen gardens are the engine rooms of this Cornish estate. At the turn of the century, they supplied the Tremaine family and their staff with all the food crucial to their survival. Now they are the only fully restored working walled gardens in Britain. The flower garden grew flowers for cutting, salad vegetables, and produced exotic fruits in its range of glass houses. The vegetable garden provided basic foodstuffs all year round. The most labour-intensive area of the Heligan estate, 18 of the 22 gardeners worked here. Today there's a staff of just six. Between these two gardens is the melon yard with its cold frames and vines. In Victorian times, the head gardener would have been in charge of all this. It was one of the most prestigious positions a working class man could aspire to. Philip Macmillan Browse is today's equivalent. He has to fathom out the methods his predecessors used to grow their food, such as how they produced pineapples thousands of miles north of the equator without glasshouse heating. See, that's not bad. It's, we've got eight in now in 20 minutes and we only had about one in in 12 minutes, didn't we? And put four in a row and give them wider spacing. So we have aisles, in other words? Yes. Okay, we could do that. In the finest traditions of the head gardener, Philip has no intention of getting his hands dirty. His right-hand man is Tom Petherick, who in the role of foreman carries out his instructions the complexities of what a head gardener would have had to face with the actual guy who had to get in and do it. I mean, there is a limit to whether you could physically get in there or not. So the guy who's going to run it, he's going to put it in the spacing that he can get away with. And yet the head gardener, he's going to say, shove them up. So they're forever probably behind one another's backs, compromising all the time. I think that's going to be the answer. Yeah, I think so. Bringing these gardens back to life is not just an exercise in nostalgia. The aim of the team is to mirror precisely the methods of the generations of Heligan gardeners before them. When you think of how fast this operation has developed in the whole gardens, we are achieving things that really are quite a phenomenal rate and learning very fast. Our learning curve of everybody who works in the gardeners, whoever the gardeners are, their learning curves have been enormously steep. Because it doesn't matter how much you think you know about gardening, we knew nothing about Victorian gardening. We had to put ourselves in the position of um, being Victorian. In 1991, when these gardens were first rediscovered, they were totally derelict. Before they could put themselves in the position of being Victorian, the team had to undertake a massive restoration task. When we first came into the melon yard, you just saw these and thought they were frames. And nobody had any idea that they particularly were pineapple pits at the time, and they were totally derelict. But the most impressive thing I remember is that about two thirds of the way down here in the manure pit on that side was an ash tree. And one of the major efforts of this restoration was not rebuilding the frame, it was actually getting in, getting this huge ash bowl out in the first instance. Uh, and I look back on that and think that that sort of thing was the major achievement of the restoration. Building it up and putting it right afterwards was chicken feed compared with some of the original recovery work that had to be done. The old Heligan gardeners were horticultural pioneers. Some of the pineapples they grew in this pit weighed as much as 18 pounds, 
With no heating other than stable manure, it was little short of a miracle. This is probably the oldest method of growing pineapples that would have been used and I suspect that this is the only pineapple pit heated in this way that's extant in Great Britain at the moment. We're heating it with the, with the hotbeds, which go through this divided wall, this hollow wall. Heat goes in at the bottom, rises and then comes into the frame through the pigeonholes at the, at the back and the front. In the old days they would use stable manure. Because it's got a lot of urine in it, it's got a lot of nitrogen in it. So consequently it'll fire up, that is it'll start to heat up and ferment very quickly. You want it to give a consistent heat for as long as possible. If we prevent them going blue this winter, I think we've got a chance of having our earliest crop probably about next June, we think, don't we, yeah, Tom? I think so. We'll close these things down and we'll feed them before we close them down. And then hopefully we won't have to do a lot more until about next early March. I think we've got it cracked now, haven't we, Tom? This is the exciting part, we're learning all this. You can't read this in books. It's a bitterly cold winter, but the vegetable garden, as in the days of the Tremaines, has produced enough greens to feed an army. It's helped by the addition of a natural ingredient from the local beach. Just like the Victorian foreman, Tom Petherick works alongside the garden staff. Well, this is Port Mellon Beach, where we come regularly to collect seaweed. And it's good conditions, really, because there's a half a southerly gale blowing and that blows right in here and brings the seaweed well not up as far as the beach as I'd like it but still there is plenty of seaweed around and we should be able to fill our tractor and trailer get it back to the gardens by lunchtime. We use it for an, a number of things mulching for making compost very labor intensive takes a long time but the benefits are, are there. It's adding organic matter um, medium, which is ideal for plant growth. I feel that um, the Victorians were particularly adept at building up levels of soil fertility, which is um, something that we noticed when we first came in to the productive gardens, that, that the vegetable garden in particular had a very, very deep topsoil, a, a topsoil that, that uh, went down to about eight, nine inches which is, I think, one of the reasons we've had such success in growing vegetables in that veg garden. The head gardener had to extend the season in, in order to please the house. And of course it was great. It was a great benefit to the host to be able to, uh, you know, bring things into the dining room that his guests mightn't see if they lived in another part of the country, especially in the north of England. So these are our sea kale beds, and we're playing around with nature here a bit. We're trying to force them, not out of season, but we're trying to wake them up from their winter dormancy, so they give us uh, an early spring crop. Um, by putting the lids over and the pots, we're getting, uh, we will, we hope to get, nice blanched shoots by cutting out the light. And uh, these will be uh, much sweeter than they would if they were a normal green colour. They're from the Brassica family and they're tough, leathery old leaves and not particularly flavoursome. But when they're, when they're white and blanched, they're very sweet. What this does mean is that they, um, they lose quite a lot of their vitamins because they have no chlorophyll in them, so they're lacking in and I think it's A and C, but they are very sweet and they were a typical Victorian crop. They're not seen much these days. And we hope to get something by the early spring, um, when the soil temperatures warm up a bit, with the help of this uh, insulation from the straw. So uh, with a bit of light, we'll get something fairly good.
it's now time to see whether we've, we've got any and whether it's nice and white, as it should be. That's just how it should be. Very pale, creamy colour. Not much leaf. You see it's, it's going out towards the light. Hasn't put on any leaf growth at all because it, it can't see the light, so it stays white. And this is the bit you eat. Don't tend to eat that bit, although you can. But that's the bit you eat. And it's steamed or boiled lightly. And it's quite sweet, very tender, and well worth all this trouble. And if you do have these forcing pots, an old bucket will do. I mean, you can use anything as long as you, as long as you keep the light out, just let in the crack so it can just grow a bit. Um, that's that's the secret. That's just how we wanted it to end up. It's perfect. One of the things about starting into a project like this is I wouldn't have come into it if I hadn't wanted to do it in the first place. So discovering what would have been grown by a Victorian head gardener has been an interesting intellectual and academic exercise by just reading every bit of book I can lay my hands on to find out what they would be thinking about, what would they be growing. That's been interesting. Then, of course, the sheer fact that then we were faced with the practicalities of producing a garden which you wanted to have period correct vegetables in. So that then necessitated me actually trying to source all the material I wanted. There aren't many varieties out there that I would now particularly want. It's surprising how quickly in three years you can put together I suppose we're growing 180 varieties of vegetables. Vegetables from seed. These are the seeds of the vegetables and uh, flowers that we use in the garden currently. The complete collection, more or less, of all the seeds that we're going to use during the course of the year. There was no historical archive concerning what was grown at Heligan at all. So it comes back to the situation that we've had to adopt, or I've had to adopt all the time, is to put myself in the position of being in the head gardener and saying, OK, what would I have grown? Um, so I've done that. What's happened is that I probably found more varieties than I expected to, which probably means that we grow a greater range of varieties than the head gardener might have done, say, in 1900. Well, this is the second early potatoes which we would like to have got in a couple of weeks ago if we could, but the weather hasn't been favourable. So it's uh, a bit behind. It's not the end of the world. Although, what are we now, almost end of March. We, it's, it's, it's not late for these, but uh, we would like to have got them in earlier. These are all the uh, varieties of first early and second early potatoes and salad potatoes that we've still got to put in. Um, how quickly they're going to to sprout, I'm not sure. All these potatoes have been chitted, that is that they've been stood on their ends and stood in the fruit room for a while, for two or three months, in order to produce shoots. And the varieties that we're growing, we've got of these earlies, first earlies and salads, something of the order of 15 or 16 varieties, um, all of which are period correct. Uh, that is pre-1910 and they're the sort of um, varieties that Victorian Edwardian head gardeners would have used. Well, I'd never seen these before. There's a variety called Salad Red and a variety called Salad Blue. You can see how blue the shoots are and in fact you can just about see how dark the skin is even if you can't see it's blue. But what's interesting about it is that when you cut it, look at that bluey purple flesh and the other one's got his salad red. Doesn't look too happy on the end there does it but you can see the colour. Um, I mean the Victorians were always exploring everything, they wanted to try everything. They were that sort of people. So yes they would have had pink skinned, pink fleshed, blue fleshed, blue skinned, white fleshed, white skinned, yellow fleshed, yellow skinned. We're in the tool shed, 
which was um, the original tool shed, but now acts as our museum, where we store a lot of the old tools that might have been used in the garden, some of which were found here, others of which were donations. Um, and this is the, the prize one, which is a collection of 12 grape storing bottles, some of which have the original charcoal in it, which was used to purify the water. The bottle was filled up and the grapes with a little long, a long woody stem put in the funnel at the end and they kept them fresh for weeks, possibly even longer. So hence the, the stories of grapes at Christmas and which is when they would have been a, a great, great party piece. Terracotta pot lifters. Never see them these days. And you can tighten up the chain as, for the size of your pot. So two people could lift large pots of ferns or shrubs or whatever they had in them. And what we've got here is a seed drill, which dates from about 1880 probably. It was made in Wiltshire, Bratton in Wiltshire. And you can see inside it has a brush. And when you fill this with seed, as you turn the wheels, the brush brushes a seed down through the spout here, the front of which has created the furrow for you. And you can regulate the size of your seed by moving the whole, moving the, the latch up and down. And we're just about to restore this one. And we'll take it down to Norman, see what he can do with it. Would have been used to sow anything from peas, not tiny seed, but I think from, from peas up through beans. We got this thing, yeah. which we need to, to fix up as best we can for, this, for the yeah. museum. Yeah, I wouldn't consider using something of this complexity anymore. Yeah, it's a little bit over the top. And take out a seed drill walking up and down on boards in seconds flat, whereas this needs maintenance and cost a fortune to have these regularly serviced and maintained. The rotational sequence in here, which we have over a couple of years, more or less worked out a standard cropping program for the vegetable garden now. We know what's going where, what spacing it's going at, and basically what varieties we use. The head gardener would have made the decisions about the balance of what was going to be grown and what was going to grow where because it was his responsibility to keep the kitchens going in the house. And the foreman uh, was the one who actually implemented things on the ground in general. However, I am sure that in those days, like it would be today, that there would have been a certain amount of discussion between the foreman and the head gardener about what was practical to do, wouldn't you think, Tom? Yes, and that's, that's how it is today, isn't it? Yes. We, we discuss together. Philip's actually done the plan um, and does the rotational plan, and I carry out the tasks and, and modify it as, as and when is necessary. One of the other things that we're very keen on and tended to be laughing about in the early stages when we started this garden was the regimentation and exactitude with which we plant things out. That was how the Victorians did it. When the plants came up, you expected them to stand there like little rows of guardsmen and salute and not be at an angle or one row closer than another. And now it's second nature to everybody that they understand that if the rows say 18 inches apart, rows are 18 inches apart. If they have to be thin to six inches apart, they are thin to six inches apart. That's what we mean by day-to-day -day implementation of things, don't we? You know? Yes. I'm uh, thinning parsnips here. I'm thinning them to about three inches. Uh, those will grow on. And then in, in a few months' time, we'll actually thin them to about six inches. They'll actually grow at that. Uh, there is more mine num numbingly boring jobs in this garden, but uh, this isn't a bad job actually. There's far worse jobs than this. So obviously, but I don't say it is a, a really brilliant job, otherwise I'll be doing it all the time and it would be boring. 
this will go in the compost heap and it'll uh, add the fertility for the soil in uh, next season. But it isn't a waste really because maybe a waste in terms of labour uh, uh, but, but there again you get a perfect row this method. You get a, a parsnip every six inches and it looks good and this garden is for show. Saying broad beans today, a double row about 80 foot long. Kind of straightforward process, really. They didn't have means of preserving food as we do these days, and so therefore, food that dries and stores well was an important part of the winter diet. And peas and beans, which do both, um, and therefore, were a very versatile crop. But you see, the thing is that these days the, the, the different types of pea and bean have improved so much. I mean, you know what a packet of bird's eye peas tastes like? They're really good, they're sweet, small, very juicy. The pea, old, olden time peas are great big, great big fat bullets that taste nothing at all. And I think it's the same with a lot of the broad beans too. But we've, um, we've, we've, we've picked ones that we feel illustrate the um, the successional cropping, sort of a, a, an autumn sown crop, and a, an early season crop, and a late season crop. A new season is always a challenge because you don't know what's going to happen. What I would like is to be sure that the rotational sequence that I've tried to establish and plan really is working properly. Last year was the first year of its operation. It's very easy to run before you can walk if you're not careful and keep on having new horizons, new ambitions of where you're going to move on to. But horticulturally, every so often, you, you just have to stand back and say, let's get everything sorted and make sure we haven't left any, missed out on anything. It's important to do it, otherwise the thing doesn't work. Then that takes time. That takes a whole year of sequences, seasonal sequences. In the summer season, the challenge in the flower garden is to produce crop after crop of flowers for cutting. If predictions are accurate, in August the pineapples should produce their first fruits. With an abundance of vegetables to harvest and no big house to supply, a new home will have to be found for all this food.